Today I'm going to talk about my uh, favorite guitar player from the uh, from the 60s and well right through. I'm going to be talking about Michael Bloomfield. I borrowed this album from uh, a friend of mine in the late 60s and I couldn't stop listening to it. There's Mike Bloomfield there and Al Cooper and uh, it got me into the blues big time after that. I really didn't, didn't listen to too much blues and really didn't know too much about the blues up to that point except that it was part of uh, influences of, on rock and roll obviously like the Rolling Stones but this, this box set came out in uh, about 2014 and it contains three CDs of uh, his music and uh, one DVD it's a, which is a documentary called Sweet Blues and that's what I'm going to talk about today is the uh, documentary. I watched it a couple times yesterday because it's only an hour long so I extended the play by watching it twice and uh, there's a lot of, uh, lot of information about his life that is crammed into that one hour. There's not much live footage of uh, Michael Bloomfield out there but they have an interview on tape that they they put through the uh, documentary of him talking about the way he looked at things, about it, the way he uh, played, and especially the blues. That was his that was his whole life was playing the blues. Uh, and uh, when he first started out, he uh, was only a teenager, and he'd go down into the uh, black clubs in Chicago to watch the blues players like B.B. King, Muddy Waters, Otis Rush and that's where uh, he got his uh, major influence and that was his obsession and they accepted him after a while and uh, they were unknown at that time basically so uh, when he joined the Butterfield Blues Band they did an extended run in San Francisco and uh, he was promoting the blues players from Chicago to Bill Graham to get them down into San Francisco in the clubs and playing and uh, he was very instrumental in getting uh, all those players that I just mentioned down and, and known because they were virtually unknown and uh, during this in, in, in this film there's a lot of interviews with different people that played with them and uh, Alvin Bishop, especially with the uh, Butterfield Blues Band, and some of the other players have uh, comments here and there. But when he got to uh, San Francisco, a lot of the bands from the uh, th from that area, like the Jefferson Airplane and uh, Quicksilver Messenger Service and uh, Country Joe and the Fish, would go see them, and and they uh, realized from watching him play. And watching the band play, that they had to up their game, and uh, from that point, a lot of them are interviewed here, and uh, the, especially the guitar players, and they uh, couldn't believe what they were seeing. I mean, Mike Bloomfield was on a different plateau than they were at that time. So uh, after he left Butterfield, which was after two albums, he formed the Electric Flag, which became a uh, I think about eight members. They had horns and he wanted to do a uh, American music type of thing with the blues and a little bit of jazz and, uh, and all, a bunch of influences all crammed into one band. And unfortunately they only lasted one record but there is a clip of them at Monterey Pop Festival in 1967 and they're playing a song called Wine which is a traditional song and putting their own slant to it. And uh, it's only about two and a half minutes and it's just crazy. It's included in this film, the whole song, and it's also from the Monterey pop movie, but it's in the outtakes. They didn't put that in the movie, which is unreal. His solo in that is just, is just ripping. Like just, every time I listen to it, it just sends chills up my spine. It's like, man, anybody that can play like that. So uh, it only lasted one album with the Electric Flag, and there's a few members that are interviewed here, Barry Goldberg, and uh, and uh, talking about him and he, and the problems that he did have. 
Mike Bloomfield never wanted to be a star. He just wanted to play the blues. He didn't like going on the road and he, he was a no-show for a lot of his uh, gigs. Al Cooper is interviewed throughout this and he uh, put together the first Super Session album and uh, he discovered, well he didn't discover him, but he, he met Mike Bloomfield at the um, like a Rolling Stone sessions and the and the album Six, Highway 61 revisited with Dylan and uh, he said he came into the room he was supposed to play guitar on on this on like a Rolling Stone but then Mike Bloomfield came in he didn't know him at that time and he came in with no case on his guitar he was out in the wet the guitar was wet so he wiped the guitar down and he just kind of whipped off a few licks and uh, Al Cooper said, there's no way he was going to play guitar on that session, in Shesson, session. and he had, ended up playing keyboard, which is a famous part of like a Rolling Stone. So uh, he had some interesting things to say. He also put together the uh, live adventures, which I just showed here. And of course, he said Bloomfield played a couple of nights, and then he was gone again. So he was really pissed off, and so was Bill Graham. There's a little interview with Bill Graham there saying they were really pissed off at him because he just left them again. And uh, there's a lot of stories like that. He, he went up to Canada to play a gig, and uh, he was supposed to play a couple nights. He left after one night, and he left his guitars in Canada like his Les Paul. I mean, <laughs> he just had no... Uh, no desire to uh, make a career and be a success and be a star and all that. He didn't want to be a commodity and he knew what would happen if, if he did. He, people would just come to see Mike Bloomfield because of who he was and, but not of what he did. So he, uh, he also suffered from insomnia which was a major part of uh, his drug taking which they a lot of people figured they just had, he had to bring himself down because his, his brain was always working and he couldn't sleep so it's too bad at the end of the uh, the uh, documentary there's a clip of him playing acoustic guitar by himself in 1980 he died in 1991 he was found in his car and he had he had uh, I guess he drug overdosed, they, I'm not exactly sure, they didn't really say. But uh, the clip is, what, is a whole song and he's just playing the blues and he's playing slide guitar on an acoustic. And it's quite wild, he's, he's like almost going off the tracks a few times and, and then he just comes right back. And you can tell he's totally improvising into the moment of just playing. He's not worried about uh, what comes next because I don't really think he knows, he's just playing. And, and the blues was uh, his whole life and it's unfortunate that, uh, well maybe it's not because that's the way he was. I mean, they recorded things of him from the, uh, especially from the 60s, it's all just stellar as far as I'm concerned. And there is a, where is it, there is a clip, well not a clip, but this is uh, called Muddy Waters, a Blues Summit in Chicago. And uh, actually, this is a bootleg. I'm <sighs> not going to tell anybody. But uh, there's a, it's Muddy Waters and Friends, basically. And uh, Dr. John's on here playing piano. And uh, Mike Bloomfield's playing a good portion of the, the uh, I think it's about an hour long, too. And uh, he does some really ripping solos here, and it's in the 70s. Uh, 70, mid 70s or early 70s. So he's, he still has a, has a touch when he wants to play live. Johnny Winter's on here and, uh, and uh, Muddy Waters Band and it's, it's a good hour long and they, they go through the classics and, uh, but uh, it's really, uh, when I found out that he was on this video, I had to find it and I did find it in, uh, in a music store, but it is a bootleg. So uh, that's my review on uh, Sweet Blues, it's called, and uh, the Mike of Mike, the m life of Michael Bloomfield, my favorite guitar player.
definitely uh, one of the top players of all time as far as I'm concerned. So long.